Hello, hello everyone online. <laughs> I hope you can hear me. Yeah, yeah. Can you guys hear me? All set? Yeah? Nice. Um, cool. Well, welcome to the call. Uh, I realized we're a little past seven, but um, we're just getting settled in uh, here at Full Note. People are still standing around. Um, so we'll just give it maybe another minute or two and get started. Um, sorry you couldn't all be with us, but we still have an awesome session for you. So just hang on one minute. <laughs> to have a special program here tonight. So of course, this is the first meetup, the first on-site token engineering meetup after nine months. And so, I'm so glad that you are here in Berlin. <laughs> yes. Thanks for coming. And also, this is an introduction to token engineering for everyone who's interested in token engineering, so nodding. And we have, again, people who are participating online, some familiar faces. Oh, yes, a lot of new faces as well. And we thought, okay, what could we do to spin this up again to get um, collaboration all across the globe going again, or visibility, also meeting each other. And token engineering is a really global community. So what we are doing at the TE Academy, for example, is across 21 time zones. So whenever we run courses, we have participants from all around the world. Our token engineering active community members are coming from all around the world. And we invited some of them to share their story tonight. So um, their background, what they are currently working on, what they think is most interesting and most relevant in token engineering at the moment. So yeah, I'm very much looking forward to the reports from uh, Vietnam, Ireland, uh, Brazil, um, Berlin, of course, um, a little bit Moscow, France. Yeah, so this will be cool. Uh, yeah, and with that, I'll hand over to Peter, Peter, um, team member of TE Academy, and uh, yeah, you'll, you'll let us know what's next. Yes, I will. Hello, everyone. Um, cool. So, yes, my name is Peter, and hello, everyone, on uh, on the Zoom meeting. This is funny. I feel like there's just cameras and screens everywhere. <laughs> so I hope all the tech is working all right. Um, a little bit closer. Okay, here we go. Nice. Uh, I'm just going to move the screen. 
Let me do this, minimize. So um, yeah, so today uh, Angela gave a bit of a background on um, the session for today already. Uh, I'm just going to be walking through um, the first two items on the agenda. Um, and actually item zero on the agenda is related to the POAPs. So everybody who's here in person or online um, is eligible for a, uh, for a POAP, proof of attendance. And for everyone in person, uh, grab one of these stickers. Angela's handing them out aggressively right now. Um, and there's a uh, website address on the back and you can type that in to redeem your POAP. Um, for everyone online, uh, either send me an email or message me on Discord. Um, both of the uh, contact info for that are on the slide. And just include hashtag TE back to Berlin in the message, and I will know you are here. And then I'll send you the redemption link. So um, cool. So now that that's over, the agenda for today, uh, going to start by answering the question, what is token engineering? It's a simple question with a not simple answer. Um, and we're only going to get to a part of it today. So there's a whole world behind that question. Um, then we're going to talk a bit about the Token Engineering Academy. Um, that's what Angela and I do. And lastly, uh, but what, act, what will actually be the majority of the session, we're going to hear from a bunch of token engineering correspondents around the world, as Angela was mentioning earlier. Um, so that'll be really cool. All right, so what is token engineering? Token engineering is an emerging discipline. It's focused on design, validation, and optimization of token-based economic systems. Got it, cool, that's it, <laughs> it's easy. Um, no, now we, uh, we can unpack this a little bit. So it's an emerging discipline. By that, basically we mean it's, it's really new, it's really young. Um, relative to crypto, it's even really young and other academic, academic uh, fields, it's extremely young. Um, so we can see here through this timeline, uh, some of the first mentions of token engineering were even in 2018. So that was just a few years ago. Um, and this came along with the first meetups. So the TE community came together in New York and Berlin um, for the first times in 2018. Um, additionally, the University of Vienna uh, opened up a crypto economic institute, which has been a catalyst for a lot of research and new findings, uh, developments for the field. So that was exciting. 2019, um, there was a reference in the MIT Media Labs blockchain journal, so gaining legitimacy. Uh, and also 2019 CAD CAD was open source. This is one of the really important, um, most commonly used tools in the token engineering space, which we'll hear about a little bit later too. Um, <clears throat> 2020, we have the TE Academy. So Angela, the founder of the TE Academy, um, which has been an awesome uh, venture since then. And we have some awesome stats. And as she was saying, our, our student base extends around the world. So it's been a wild ride for the last just year and a half, I guess, year and a little bit. Um, and finally, some more recent updates. Uh, another very important um, ecosystem in token engineering uh, world is the TE Commons. And the TE Commons successfully hatched this year, just a couple months ago. Um, so that was really exciting. And this is a DAO that's uh, aiming to fund token engineering public goods. So very important. Um, but yeah, as you can see, token engineering is quite young and only uh, getting larger, which is really exciting. There we go. Um, all right, now to the uh, second point from that original quote, um, token-based economic systems. So these are blockchain systems built with crypto economics. This is where a token engineer lives. Um, and the crypto economic flower, which is in the middle of this slide, uh, is something you'll probably see around the token engineering space. Um, and this flower does a nice job of uh, describing all of the overlaps and the interdisciplinary nature of token engineering as a field. Um, so everything from industrial and systems engineering to political science and governance, philosophy, economics, computer science, um, all of these fields, technical, non-technical, um, they, they all overlap in crypto economics and which just means that token engineering can be the home for anyone, no matter what you studied or what your expertise is. Um, so it's really exciting and everyone who wants to be a token engineer could contribute something. So, um, and then a bit of, uh, to help even out the relationship between token engineering and crypto economics, um, we kind of think that 
uh, token engineering is essentially applied crypto economics, um, and it's all very multiple, just multidisciplinary in nature. Um, so yes, now the design validation and optimization piece. So this is what token engineers do um, and the token engineering process. Uh, so this process is very long and um, I'll, I say this at the end, but I'll start with it too. It is actually not a linear process despite this line and the arrows, <laughs> um, but it's a very iterative process. And there's um, many points in the, in the TE process, you'll go back and redo steps um, and et cetera. So just keep that in mind. Um, so design validation and optimization. Um, we start with system ideation. And system ideation is um, where you and your team or anyone with an idea for a token-based ecosystem or token-based system um, works hard to identify the purpose and the goals of that system. So this means understanding the stakeholders, their motivations, what value is being is flowing around this ecosystem, what are the interactions, which actions can people take in the ecosystem. So these are the policies. Um, and overall thinking about the value flows. Um, so who's doing what and which value is moving where um, and really understanding that on a theoretical level um, <clears throat> will help uh, with the, as the ecosystem moves, moves forward um, in development. And this is a really fun process because it's just really creative and non-technical so anyone can do it. Um, it's a lot of brainstorming. Now, uh, the next stage in the TE process is the engineering design process. Um, so this is a, there's, there's a lot in this process. So this is one of the slides that you could go into for many hours. Um, and we have, there's recordings online from some of our sessions uh, in the past that dive into this. But um, this is a process that was kind of pioneered by Block Science, who you'll also hear that name a lot um, in the TE space. And it starts out with um, more, uh, structurally building your system in using diagrams to really understand the boundaries of the system, what actors are there, um, and the stock and flow diagrams that actually mentioned on the last slide um, would be part of this too. And then moving actually into the, um, is everything okay? Yeah, this is recording over here. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. So where was I? Ah, oh, yeah. Um, so moving from the uh, the system diagrams and mapping actually into the mathematical specs. So creating the formulas that represent the value flows between all the pieces of the ecosystem. And then moving into the modeling phase. So translating the math formulas into Python code using CAD-CAD, for example. Um, and finally, simulating these models. So running simulations to see what will happen um, given random scenarios in your ecosystem, depending on, on the different actions that are available and kind of almost trying to break the system, like see if there are any, any edge cases um, that you need to prepare for or build around. Um, and yeah, overall, just trying to make sure that your system is still uh, developed in a way that helps you reach the system goals and purpose that you set in the ideation phase. Um, and as you can see, even within this step, it's very iterative. Uh, so then finally moving on to implementation. Um, this is a little bit more simple, but this is just where you would be able to actually implement the, the system. So writing smart contracts, deploying it, um, translating the policies and the actions that you've mapped out into algorithms um, and adding the code. So setting it live, it's exciting. Um, and then moving on to the end, we have the optimization phase, uh, and this part actually never really ends. It's the monitoring and intervention um, and innovation. So this is more around maintaining system health. So is the system you built to do its purpose still achieving its purpose? Um, and maybe even the goals have changed. So back to the iteration, you have to go very back to the beginning and be like, is this system still, are these still the system goals? Um, because it's behaving differently now that we've uh, launched it. And um, yeah, more optimization, computer-aided governance. Obviously, these are decentralized systems, so you need to govern them to govern them to make decisions on how to change it. Um, and computer-aided governance becomes a huge factor there. And we're also going to hear a bit more on this topic related to the Gitcoin DAO um, later on from Danilo. So 
maintaining system health, health is also very important. Uh, and then, yeah, as I said before, it's not linear. There's a lot of back and forth. Um, I prefer to make the like big swooping arrows, but I could only do the straight ones on, on Google Slides, so <laughs> looks a little lame, but you get the idea. <laughs> okay, um, now about the Token Engineering Academy. Gonna let some more people in, nice. Um, cool, about the Token Engineering Academy. What are we? Uh, the TE Academy has a mission to develop this new engineering discipline. Um, so these are a couple of fun hashtags that we use to represent what we what we do. My favorite one is hashtag open science because um, we do a lot of stuff and then just their public lectures. We put the recordings on YouTube. People watch them forever and it's just extremely valuable information. It's actually kind of how I got into the space is just watching videos one after another and they're like, why is this public? This is extremely valuable, but it is. It's open science. <laughs> um, we want to educate aspiring token engineers and grow the number of token engineers in crypto. There are not enough token engineers at the moment. Um, every token engineer has 100% of their time filled doing token engineering. Um, so we need more of them and we want to be part of that. Um, <clears throat> finally, create a new Web3 value flows for education and research. Um, we think that there's an opportunity to uh, maybe switch up the, the motivations and the incentive mechanisms in the education space um, a little bit different than they're set up today to maybe reward some of the original content creators, researchers, lecturers, uh, things like that, because teachers are important. We need teachers to educate more token engineers. <laughs> um, we are very values driven, of course. We want to build systems that rather than trying to optimize humans, provide the maximum degree of freedom while providing, while preventing dangerous conditions. Um, so this is kind of a fun one to think about because you don't want to just define all of the possible actions and then tell everyone to go. You want to actually just build the guardrails um, and then people behave as they want, but hopefully don't find themselves in dangerous conditions. Um, as our students go, uh, Angelo was mentioning a bit of this before, but they're from all over the world. We've had over 700 participants um, in our training programs across 21 time zones. Um, people are willing to attend lectures at crazy hours, which is uh, often kind of funny to see. Um, you know, the sun is rising on the left of your screen and it's setting on the right of your screen. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's always interesting. Um, and more on our students, uh, as we were talking about the crypto economic flower earlier, they come from all different kinds of backgrounds, um, a little bit heavier in the technical side. I think that's kind of the nature of the space, but more and more of our research programs are um, actually kind of demanding people in the less technical spaces. Um, for example, the Governance program, which we will hear from Libby about in a little bit, um, is all focused on governance. So this is like political science and things. It's, not very technical, but it's extremely important. Um, and what else? Yeah, data science, physics, mathematics, um, these are all really popular, but additionally, the social, social sciences. Um, <clears throat> and it's really cool to see where people come from, art, philosophy. And lastly, the TE Academy um, has a lot of thanks to give to our partners. Uh, so these are the people that we run programs with, um, get funding from, and overall try and increase the number of token engineers so that these systems get better too. Um, <clears throat> so this is, uh, yeah, Boson, Balancer, Ocean, Hydra, Gitcoin, Block Science, and there's a few others that aren't even on here, um, but we have some really awesome partners uh, and have been able to create awesome content with them. And this is just a video or a picture, a couple of pictures of some of the fun things we get to do in the TE Academy. Um, Danilo is in the top middle screen, actually. He, you'll be hearing from him later. Um, we like to talk with our hands and show charts. So uh, that's it for the what is token engineering in the TE Academy. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. And I think we'll get to questions at the end, but um, for now, we want to hear from the token engineers around the world. So let's see who's first. Um, Tamara will be in here yet. 
Okay, well, first is Tam. Tam, are you in the call? I didn't see you on a quick glance, but. Okay, if not, we will come back to Tam. All right, so actually first will be Vasily. And this is a tricky one because the arrow is pointing to Russia, but he's actually in Berlin this week, <laughs> uh, conveniently, but we swear he's in Russia usually. Um, yeah, so Vasily will be talking about token engineering and DeFi. Uh, yeah, hello everyone. So I think I will a little bit narrow down this topic to some DeFi questions. So because the theory, uh, yeah, I'm talking about is quite big, so all this model simplification, mathematics, and so on. So I will try to keep it simple and <laughs> discuss all the different questions here. So and probably can start yeah. presenting. I need to be there. Yeah. Uh, so here are your slides, and you can hit there. Yeah. Yeah. So this is my my background. So I'm chemist by education. I'm a PhD in chemistry and worked with some intercalation complex inorganic compounds. So, but after that, I joined the crypto ecosystem and I'm happy with that. So I was engaged in DeFi research in token engineering community from early days, participating in hackathons and worked on some grants like Balancer Labs grants and some other ones. Also contributing to token engineering book led by Sablim. I think a lot of people know this book and Sablim as well. So, and also I'm a head of research in PowerPool now. So. I'm managing the research activities for DeFi products. So I think this is the main topic for today. So any DeFi product is uh, basically a complex system, <laughs> which is fueled by people's minds. So when you deploy it, when people start to use this, mainly permissionless uh, protocols with some financial products that you can use, exchanges, lending, structured investment products and some other ones, you deposit your own money, people deposit their own money. So if there will be some error, I mean, not uh, the error in code that was not audited, but economic vulnerabilities, some, some other things, people can partly or completely lose their funds. And this is very painful for everybody. So, and this uh, leads to a lot of what if questions. So, and the only way to get some answers and not get wrecked as people on DeFi said, is to make some prototypes of products. So basically make a digital twin in Python, uh, it's the same as for other systems, but uh, in DeFi, you have building blocks. For example, you have IMM pool models, you have lending uh, protocols models. So basically, you have something to work with from the very beginning, and this is really good. So for example, lists of IMMs, yield integrators, and some other products can be verified, simulated, and at least you can get some assumptions. What if market will be super volatile or something like that? What will be the people's risks? In this case, so here are some examples of problems, possible solutions. For example, you have a balancer pool, and you want to assume what will be the increment loss in current conditions of the market, and what will be the arbitrageur agent profit. So basically, the arbitrageur agent profit is the cost of rebalancing. So this is what is paid <laughs> to people who make arbitrage trades to re to rebalance the balancer pool. So very simple task, but. It can be very painful to your personal budget if you are if provider in this pool, so you need to understand that. Or if you're building such product, you need to share it with people. So and the, this is a simple example. So we just take a pool and all math from balance revival model that was created also <laughs> by token engineering team uh, and I participated in this. And we added arbitrage agent model and some external market data. And this arbitrage agent just trade with the pool and we can see how it goes. Of course, it's a signified model, but this is at least something that we can get. Uh, other examples include, for example, in HydroDX, in the current research group, they uh, offered a new IML formula with uh, ways that are dynamically changed based on trade, so very interesting one. And basic question, is it suitable for indices or not? So we also take uh, math, make a pool uh, in Python, add arbitrage agent, add external market data for particular example at least, and we can see how it works and would they implement loss would it be lower than the balance or would it be bigger or what is going on? So, or for example, we use uh, urn walls for creative structure in investment products. So you have a basket of walls that generate interest over time, but this interest is not stable, it changes over time. So we need to make the linear combination of these walls and try to keep it you know, efficient for little generation. So I, 
if we can just get market data from uh, some gene analytics and the graph, understand how this walls accumulate interest, and after that, make some strategies that uh, just verify different assumptions regarding how we need to rebalance this set of walls. And this is also very valuable because if you have like dozens of millions of people's money inside the pool and it's not efficient, and they lose even two or three percent annually on stable coins, is a huge yield. So, uh, and the latest example is about the impermanent losses in use of victory. For example, you want to provide a PDT in use of victory and you have, I don't know, $10,000 for this, and you can create a position, see how it will work, what will be your permanent loss uh, according to uh, for last month of uh, market data. That, so here is uh, Uniswap is UDT. It is a good pair for demonstration because it was huge, uh, huge volatility on this pair. So you can see how the fees accumulated over time and what is your impermanent loss and different you know prices of Uniswap. And maybe this will lead you to <laughs> understanding that uh, uh, you saw the position management protocols are better for you than if you will manage your funds yourself. So, and such simple questions can be solved by token engineering tools. And what is good here, what I want to mention is that the majority of uh, code and the majority of models is already created. So, we have balancer model, we have the Uniswap model. Balancer two also was created uh, by token engineering community members. So, you can just take these models and add something that you want to verify and get answers to your questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, we can take questions. Uh, let's do questions on token engineering and DeFi. So not only do DeFi building blocks exist, but token engineering building, token engineering DeFi blocks exist. That's cool. Questions in the chat. Yeah, so I will uh be watching the chat does anybody have any questions from berlin about token engineering and defi all clear all clear okay we have one uh what would you say is the biggest unsolved problem that in DeFi? yeah <laughs> so I work in with IMS the majority of time. So, so personally for me, it is a permanent loss because I think if we will solve the permanent loss in IMS, it will be I don't know, the new page in the whole industry. But probably there are a lot of other questions. But for me, IMS are closer to my you know, personal research agenda. So this is why I define it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'm usually scared about uh, I'm new to this. I'm new to the space. What is impermanent loss and what is the impact if you solve that challenge? So the, the impermanent loss, it is. Uh, so just imagine you have Ethereum and USDC, for example. And, just come over here and talk. Yeah. yeah, and you want to supply it into IMM pool, to the Uniswap IMM pool to provide liquidity. And you estimate that you will get some fees probably from this, right? So this is maybe your motivation for doing this. But if you supply your liquidity to, to Uniswap, it will, so your holdings inside the pool will be changed according to current market price because if arbitrageurs, they trade with the pool, they change the, the ratio of tokens. So for example, you deposited one ETH and 3K USDC at the very beginning of all this journey. But if the Ethereum will grow significantly, you will have much less Ethereum and bigger share of USDC, but it can be, so the sum of Ethereum that you still hold and this increased uh, UTT amount, if you will recalculate the Ethereum in, into a new price, it will be lesser than you deposited. That, 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 that if you just hold this USDT and uh, Ethereum on your personal wallet without any involvement in, uh, in MM pool. So, so basically if price is going up significantly or going down significantly, uh, like 99 percent of probability that you will have less money than that in case you will just hold it on your wallet because fees are not upsetting a permanent loss in majority of cases if market is flat and for example your assets didn't change in value significantly but people traded with this pool and fees are accumulated probably your fees income will upset this low impermanent loss but anyway so in the majority of cases when people uh, deposit liquidity to IMM pools, 
especially for some, for example, new tokens that can be pumped a lot or dumped a lot, they will lose money on this. Unless they use some you know, professional services for install V3 position management, and the majority of them are even not launched yet, so they're on the testing phase. So in, in install V3, the impermanent loss is even bigger because in install V2, when you uh, deposit your liquidity, you deposit for the whole price ranges from zero to infinity. But if you deposit uh, in install V3, you will need to set up the lowest price of the position, highest price of the position. For example, you deposit Ethereum from uh, 3K to 3.2K. So, and you provide bits only in this range. Uh, it, mean, it, it means that uh, if Ethereum will exceed 3.2K, your position wouldn't be used anymore for you know, trading, wouldn't collect uh, any trading fees, and you will get uh, 100 percent of your stake in USDT. So it means that Ethereum will grow further, but you wouldn't get zero. You wouldn't get any profits from that. And in the opposite, if the Ethereum price goes below 3K, your position will be 100 uh, percent composed of Ethereum. So, and if Ethereum will go lower and lower, it means that your position will also in USD in USD terms go lower and lower. So that's it. And the simple calculation it shows that the increment loss in use of GTA for such narrow positions uh, uh, is bigger than in use of V2, for example. For, for the same price range, if you will see a, a 3.2K, 3K, for example, because a 3.2K, you will still have some part of the deal in use of V2, but in of V3, if your position is uh, narrow between 3 and 3.2K, you will lost or you pull your Ethereum and can get converted to USDT. So, so basically, this impermanent losses, I think the major problem in decentralized exchanges at the moment, because equity providers, they can lose money and this requires some projects, for example, to provide equity money programs to offset this impermanent loss by newly minted tokens, by inflation. So this is maybe not so good because we all want to get income from fees, right? But we cannot do it sometimes. And this is like, so. And for example, Hydrogix, they uh, provided two IMM formula for I want to change weights over time based on trades, and this from theory can contribute in lowering this impermanent loss thing. But we need to verify it, so it's not verified by me at least. So I don't try. Yeah, but I'm not considering myself as impermanent loss problem solver. I just verify the problem because it's a big problem, not for one person. The whole team is working on it. Impermanent loss. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Vasily. Um, okay. So I know I saw Tamara enter the chat or enter the Zoom call. Um, Tamara, we're going to come to you next. Great. Hearing comments. And you should be able to just unmute. And I think we can all hear you here. Okay, um, I'm trying to share my screen and it says I can't share my screen while the other participant is sharing. Okay, I will stop sharing. All right, so I can't see anyone there, but uh, hello. Um, you should neighbor. be able to see the full note TE crowd. Oh, hi, thanks, Angela. Hi, everyone. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. Okay, so um, uh, I feel like if I knew a week earlier that this was happening, I might have actually hopped on a plane and come to Berlin. Uh, I'm only in Bordeaux, so not far from everyone in Berlin. Okay, so thank you for inviting me here to give an update about uh, the TEC. Um, I wasn't sure how familiar people would be with it, so I'm doing also a sort of little like brief history of the TEC, a little bit about our mission, a little bit about how we're organized, what we're up to now, and then a call to come join us if any of this sounds interesting to you. Okay, so um, let's get started. So uh, maybe we get started with like, what is a commons? So it's um, land or resources belonging uh, or affecting a whole community that's managed by that community. Often called CPRs or common pool resources. Public goods fit into this, um, into this category. And the genesis story of the TEC is basically happened in 2019 in uh, Thailand, 
where uh, Dr. Michael Zargum, Griff Green, and Jeff Emmett had an idea. <laughs> and in 2020, um, they liaised with the Angela and uh, many people in the token engineering community. Um, and together with the token engineering community in CommonStack, shared a vision and wanted to see it realized. Uh, that vision was realized just in August of this year when the TEC hatched. Um, what that means essentially is that we uh, we raised, we had a token offering where we raised funds from um, people who are assured to be value aligned, um, you know, long-term sustainable systems over short-term profit people, people that were uh, part of what is called the trusted seed, an organization of value aligned proof of altruist persons in uh, token engineering and commons and in our space in general. Um, so that's the that's the the genesis story to the hatch story. And in between this story, what happens? Well, there was a lot of bootstrapping, community building, culture building, organizational design, learning, tweaking, trial and error, many, many things that happened. Um, and we um, we have uh, what I'll share with you is our mission. Um, and in short, it's to become a shelling point for the TE community. But what that really means is, our goal is to support your projects. <laughs> we wanna to support token engineering um, education, places like the TE Academy, the TEC Labs, many other educational uh, organizations and initiatives. We wanna search, uh, sorry, support uh, token engineering research, uh, open source systems and tools. Um, so the funds that we've raised are, are designated for, or many of it, much of it is designated for supporting token engineering. Our goal is to advance token engineering. We're also a very warm community. So some of our, our uh, values is being pro-social and human-centered uh, perspective, radically open source, non-hierarchical, accountable, these kinds of things. Okay, so who are we and how are we organized? So um, some figures, there's over 400 contributors in our community. So we have uh, tons of people that come in and uh, come out. Um, in our latest uh, orientation call, uh, we had about 14 people, and not the one today, but the one before. So really uh, the community is growing and growing. Uh, we have 11 working groups um, focusing on different subjects, different streams of work. Some of them are really core to the DAO operations like transparency and communitas, which is community building, um, communications, of course. And some of them are really quite standalone. Uh, the TEC Labs is basically its, its own um, initiative. Uh, Omega, which Shebnam leads, is its own initiative. And I'll talk a little bit about them in a moment. Um, and we have uh, 17 stewards, and the stewards are responsible for guiding the community, for being in the know about the community, for welcoming people, and for leading uh, uh, coordination and other uh, knowledge initiatives in the TEC. Okay, what's coming up? Oh, I think it's worth saying, although it's on the last slide too, um, we have a community call tomorrow at 8 p.m. on the TEC Discord, and we have an orientation call. So if you're curious, but you want, you're not really sure what to ask yet, uh, every Wednesday at 6 p.m. there's a community call. I'm going to have all the links in this and try to share it with uh, Peter and Angela, so uh, uh, maybe on your Discord, on the TEC Discord server too. All right, so uh, maybe I'll talk a little bit about what's coming up. So this is our timeline. Uh, if I jump into it, uh, we can get into a little more detail. And we have um, these group of hatchers, so who contributed to the TEC, and now they hold TEC H tokens, TEC hatcher tokens. And there's a lot of advice process in the forums, some community voting, and there is um, within the next two weeks, param parties to start building an economy. Uh, we also have a timeline which shows what all of the working groups are doing uh, sprint by sprint. Also on our forum, we have a weekly update that shares some of the things that are happening um, every week. Uh, I wanna give you a few things that might be of particular interest to the people in this room. Uh, the TEC Labs fall semester is in progress. Uh, I asked YGG this morning for a one sentence about how to promote the labs. And he said, it's a space to open up emerging tech and tools in the TE world and examining mechanisms and systems. 
And YGG is something like a bit of a wizard. So basically every Friday he comes and he uh, scratches his curiosity. You know, he itches his curiosity, something that be, might be interesting to him and then does um, some data science, some Python, some CAD CAD uh, to examine something in, in detail. Uh, he, he mentioned it's something like if you are a medical student and there's a surgeon uh, who's performing an operation and then there's like all the medical students around, around the, the doctor, uh, it's a little bit like that. Uh, sometimes it can be more collaborative. Sometimes a few people will be hacking on the same uh, set of data or the same um, model or the same problem as well. So they're doing the um, reward research right now. Uh, and he's also working on the proposal inverter. So there's a lot of really cool real uh, core token engineering work happening in the labs. I'd also like to share the gravity uh, group. The gravity is the gravity working group is the group responsible for conflict transformation in our community. Um, and um, there was uh, earlier this year, a, uh, I think it was 10 week series of nonviolent communication, mediation, conflict resolution. Uh, we are in the fourth session of the second cohort and it runs through November 23rd. It's open to anyone to participate. In fact, everything in the TEC is open to everyone to participate. And if you look at the calendar, you can jump into any working group meeting that it is your, uh, that strikes your fancy. Um, you can jump into any of the trainings, any of the, of the social events, uh, and you will be um, warmly welcomed. Uh, I'd also like to share the Communitas Working Group. So the Communitas Working Group is newly formed and their real focus is on the onboarding experience to, to make it even better than it is now, promoting social events, building relationships with token holders, as well as doing outreach with value aligned DAOs and other organizations. So really building DAO to DAO relations as well as uh, relations with the people in our community. Okay, that's some cool stuff, but I have some more cool stuff to share. So um, one of the big things that happening is the Params Working Group is building a commons upgrade dashboard. So um, the hatch is part of a two phase process to launch the commons. The hatch is a very simple DAO that affords the community uh, a DAO to store funds as well as some uh, basic voting mechanisms. And the commons upgrade is launching the bonding curve. So the token will be available to the public as well as conviction voting. This is happening in a very open community, um, community decision uh, process. Um, I can give you a little sneak peek because it's actually quite neat. So uh, if you go to the beginning of this, uh, let's see. So this is the this is the tool that the Params group is building so that everyone in our community can learn about the parameters for um, the conviction voting. Uh, and augmented bonding curve, and then can actually I would, submit I would just their. Add that this is live token engineering. This is live <laughs> token engineering. You're here, seeing it here first. Cool. Thanks for adding that, whoever said. Um, and so there's the there's a um, yeah. So this means that everyone can can change some parameters. How long the hatch tokens should be frozen? Maybe somebody wants it to be much more than a year, uh, two years. Um, and thaws uh, the opening price, and to sort of to see actually what that will what will happen to the uh, price of the token. Um, here with the bonding curve, the, uh, the tributes you could set the price of the tributes. You can uh, maybe suggest if you think that the market is going to be bearish or bullish, and you can see how the uh, current supplies, the price of current supplies, and everything sort of uh, plays out with the or is modeled with these scenarios. So this is happening um, very soon in the next two weeks. Uh, right now we are in the process of dog fooding our own dashboard. So we are the people who are using this and um, setting some tests. And uh, as you can see, it's pretty far along. There's just some minor changes to make before we start inviting the wider community to come and design their own economy with us. Um, okay, so. 
Okay, so come join us. If any of things this was interesting to you, um, I would say the first thing to do is scan this code right now and hop onto our Discord server. Uh, follow us on Twitter, jump into our forums, uh, follow our, our TEC calendar, and hop into any of the meetings that are interesting to you. Uh, there's a handbook that you can read to get more information, and everyone is always invited um, to our community call where each of the working groups present what the working group is working on. So you get a really good breadth of what the entire uh, TEC is working on at that time. And thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Pam. Yes, we will. Uh, yeah, Pam, if you want to share the links on the chat, um, we can do that. And then also we'll grab them from you later to send around to the email list. Sounds good. And are there any questions about the TEC? Also in the chat works. <laughs> <laughs> Questions can come from anywhere. <laughs> okay, all right. I guess I have one question. All right, there's a question from Mortz. Uh, uh, like this, so, does the T Commons currently consider its focus on the crypto space as a whole, or is there also sort of the sense that? we want to support the wider project space out there doing interesting commons focused stuff but not necessarily crypto oriented Tam, could you hey, hear that yeah and that's a great question um so really the the mission of the token engineering commons is token engineering. So it's really specific to things that are happening for advancing token engineering. But the um, the blueprint, the, the stack that token engineering commons used or has deployed is um, a creation of the commons stack, which is a organization that is building these commons frameworks, a, a cultural stack and a technical stack so that it can be used for future other kinds of commons. So yeah, I hope that answers the question. And I'm actually a trusted seat member, but it's good to get that reminder about what the role division is there. Thank you. All right, anything else? Hello. Cool, otherwise I will share my screen again. Thank you, Tam, awesome presentation. Um, yeah, always great to hear from the TEC, and let's see who's next. We already heard from Basili. So now we are on to Danilo. Um, and Danilo actually has two topics, the CAD CAD Wikipedia and computer-aided governance slash system health. Um, Danilo, are you on the call? Yeah. So, awesome. um, yeah, uh, I'm going to need to compress a bit because I have 10 minutes. So I'll leave Wikipedia for probably Angela has the contest for it. So I'm going to do some update on computer aided governance and uh, system health. Um, I'm going to share my screen here quickly. Um, so you need to stop sharing. Yeah. Yes, here. So, okay. So just for a quick background, uh, my name is Danilo. Uh, I'm a research engineer at Block Science. And I mean, uh, it's a long deal, so I'm going to skip it, but probably you guys are going to see as I present here. Uh, but one thing that I want to present about is about is really about one trend that we've been seeing as, uh, as our token economies get more mature and so on, which is really about operational digital twins. Uh, hey, Danilo, if you're able to get any closer to your mic, I think the speaker system's here a little quiet. Here's a little quiet. Uh, let me see if I can uh, increase this sound. We can hear you okay. It's just not like super clear. But mm. if not, you can go for it. Yeah, uh, let me see here quickly. So yeah, the, the mic is out there on the maximum here. Okay, that's all right. We can, we can hear pretty well. Okay, so uh, just to explain here what is our operational digital twin, it's really, let's say, one way of using CAD CAD models, and it's a counterpart for computer aided governance over new systems. And one thing that I usually like to start this presentation is really by talk about, let's say, what we are in with those digital twins. So 
Does the digital twin CR computational representations of a system that we are, uh, we are describing? Uh, but the operational digital twins, we have this target at first. Uh, it's not that we have, let's say, complete choice over the parameters and the initial state, because we already have a system that, let's say, it's working and it's already on its trajectory. Uh, but what we are interested in is really about, let's say, pre predicting the future state of it based on, for example, what we change the parameters. Those parameters, they could be environment in the sense that they add stochastic to the uh, system, or they could be deterministic in the sense that they act actually change how uh, the logical system works. So one analogy that I always use is really about uh, the climate models that's being used on climate research, on IPCC and so on. Because uh, we do have, let's say, an entire historical time series that we need to take into account in order to have our initial state. And also, not only the initial state, but also to, um, let's say, to know also what's the feasible range of parameters that we could use on our environmental processes. But at the same time, we are interested in, let's say, steering the system so that uh, it achieves certain outcomes. So a digital twin, let's say, they do, uh, operational digital twin has an emphasis on that, on, let's say, on giving, uh, providing, let's say, a state of the health of the system right now. And it can be complex in the sense that, let's say, you can have several perspectives about it a lot, because the digital twin can incorporate, like, for example, uh, I mean, I won't give too much on that have to hold. So yeah, so summarizing, uh, what the, uh, if we understand digital twin as an algorithm representation of the system, and most of the time on the token GB setting, this is almost always a CAD-CAD model. Uh, what makes our operational digital twin is first, that, that digital twin must be aware of what's happening right now. So this requires that in question, this requires a backtest and validation, and also identifying any environmental process. And another thing is that the, the operational digital in order to be used, it must be able to do extrapolation under a variety of scenarios. Um, and this is a lot related with the competitive the governance. I'm not exactly sure how much you guys have seen this map, but uh, I mean, probably you guys are going to have access to the slides and there is this link here that provides a nice overview. Uh, but the idea is that on a real system, um, on a token system, uh, we need to go over several steps in order to make sure that, let's say, the governance is sound. So having completed either governance is really about, let's say, going over all this process, which is related to observation, ask ourselves questions, uh, mapping those questions in regards to, let's say, uh, to processes or to mechanisms and so on. By mapping that, we could model that by using several tools, like, for example, CAD-CAD, the token spice, and so on. And by modeling that, by doing simulations over those questions that we have, we have asked, we can, let's say, present uh, what's our current understanding of what we are representing with that, so that we can debate and enact actions. And at the same time, we can monitor what we have enacted and also what we have observed. It's not exactly a linear process, it's really a summary. Uh, but the thing is, uh, operational digital twin is really about, let's say, making sure that we can go over this loop in terms of first, observe the system, because we have a representation and we can construct metrics based on that representation. But also provided that we have a model, we can also, let's say, ask about questions about counterfactuals and so on. Uh, anyway, there is a history description that link here. So I won't go into that. And operational digital twin, uh, one way that I also like a lot to explain is about uh, the phases of the execution. Because uh, the operational digital so it's really about, let's say, going over, uh, starting with, it's, it's really about, let's say, making use of a CAD-CAD model to, let's say, go, go all the steps through from data retrieval towards prediction. So the idea is that, let's say, we have a phase zero, which is half the representation. We have a phase one execution, which, which is about getting the data, getting everything that we know about the system in terms of data. Second one, it would be related to, to backtest, which is given that we have the data. Uh, is our representation matching uh, what we would expect from that? Uh, is, let's say, the observed test uh, matching what we think how the test should have been? So this is related to backtesting. Uh, if you are able to trust that, then we can move forward to extrapolation because if we have that representation and that representation works on the past and it could work on the future, 
by introducing environmental process, by introducing, for example, behavioral changes over the future, we could do limited extrapolations. And by making use of, let's say, of a variety of, let's say, of what we think that could happen in the future, we could actually predict it. And of course, prediction is always conditional on not only probability, but also the scenarios and assumptions that you may make over those uh, driving processes. And that the operation of digital twins really, let's say, a way of encapsulating in independent containers each one of those uh, steps. So those are the six uh, co core components of an uh, operational digital twin uh, I have listed here. So as I said, CAD CAD model, uh, the capacity of, the, of preparing and retrieving the data, the capacity of uh, backtesting and performing validation, and also a uh, capacity of, let's say, making sure that, for example, if you have any free parameter, we are able to adjust against the past, which is system identification. The fifth one is the capacity to project over the future. And the sixth component that, let's say, a lot of times goes under the radar, but it's super important, is also the capacity of having reports. In the sense that uh, one thing that I always tell people is that, let's say, the core functionality of a CAD-CAD module, it's always to generate data. Uh, what CAD-CAD does is, is just to generate data. But to be able to extract insights from it, to be able to visualize that and, let's say, see if it makes sense or not. It's really, let's say, the data visualization. And what get get does is really to, let's say, to make us able to generate data according to our representation. So we need to make it this that, let's say, having uh, a report component and a UX component, it's, important, it's a core component. And for example, uh, I've been saying that those operational digital twins, they are a trend. Uh, they are start uh, because as we get more mature ecosystems, they are moving from design phase towards operations phase because, I mean, uh, the design phase has a special importance when the system was not launched or when you are still iterating. But as this, those get, systems get more mature, you have more emphasis on that. And for example, this is one example of an architecture of our operational digital thing that has been launched uh, on the last month, which is the Reflexor 1. But it's not a single one. Uh, there is one for Filecoin. Uh, there is another one for Uniswap. Uh, but for example, the way that it works is that, let's say, once a week, you have a script that, let's say, triggers that so that uh, you go over the entire workflow. You consume from a variety of data sources, like, for example, uh, most, of, most of them comes from the Ethereum blockchain, like, for example, uh, the Ethereum versus SD price on Chainlink. There are some metrics regarding the controller and Uniswap. We collect all of that on this box here, which is the, pre the preparation, which is really related to not only retrieve the current data, but also to retrieve the set of assumptions. So this is one core component. There is the core component of back test, which is uh, we get that uh, past data, we run against the, uh, we use that as input on our CAD representation, and we need to compute several validation methods. So we have loss functions. The way that you define loss functions, um, I mean, you can have one loss function against one variable or against several variables. You can also happen to have, for example, variables that uses different uh, loss functions. So um, the reason of why we have this framework and where component has in that is really because, I mean, uh, there are so many things that you could have, let's say, just one person working on just one component because of the richness of how you could compute, validate, for example, uh, that representation. But anyway, uh, once you do that, there are, for example, this type of system identification where we fit any relevant stochastic process and we also estimate the model parameters. And also we are able to trust it, our model because, I mean, it has performed well across uh, those validation metrics and also because we have found, uh, let's say, uh, parameters that work for the stochastic process. We can then proceed to the extrapolation, which is really about, let's say, what we think uh, the future is going to be and uh, what we think the future is going to be, let's say, if, we, for example, there is a conservative scenario or maybe a um, more, more optimistic scenario or what happens, for example, if we have a shock on the middle. So the extrapolation must always make sense of what we want to know about the future. It's not that, let's say, the future is going to be that, but it's really about, let's say, encoding uh, the possible uh, outcomes from the future. And of course, having all those boxes, they all relate to the visualization, diagnostics, and reports. So, I mean, put a special emphasis on how you are going to visualize, how you're going to generate that data so that you can visualize easily. It's always a thing that a lot of times goes under the header, but 
it's the difference between yeah. having a digital twin that let's say it's easy to consume, it's easy to, I mean, to be practical in value. And just to show, for example, one example what comes. So this visualization actually comes from the high digital twin. Uh, did it make sense of all of those process that I did went through here? So to explain a bit, um, the first thing to keep in mind is this line here on the middle, which uh, this digital twin was running, uh, was executed on June, on 3rd June. And before that line, we are not extrapolating any. We're simply, let's say, back test. We are simply getting the real data uh, using our CAD-CAD model and computing what our CAD file model thinks it should have been. While after that line, we are on the extrapolation mode. We are trying to uh, estimate what things are going to happen on, on the future. And those three uh, boxes here, they are different variables. So here, for example, the first one, you have a estimate of the Ethereum price. I mean, we have the headless at Ethereum price, but after the line, we have a random, we have a, what we think that, I mean, we have several multi color runs over the Ethereum price. And the bottom two here, our metric is related to the high uh, controller, like for example, the redemption price, the redemption rate. I'm not going to go over exactly what they mean because I mean, high could take an entire workshop of its own. But the main point is that they are metrics that depend on the CAD representation in order to be able to compute reliable. And if you take, for example, the blue and the headline here at the uh, right corner, you have, for example, head one is, for example, exactly what happened on the history. And the, uh, actually, it's the opposite. The head one is what our CAD, -CAD model thinks it should have been. And the blue one is the act exactly what happened. So you can see, for example, that uh, it doesn't quite match up, but it's close. And this, let's say, this makes, uh, this creates, for example, something that let's say we can see. And for example, if the error is too large, we can criticize that and try to fix the CAD -CAD representation. Or if not, it means that most probably we are, we are able to trust the extrapolation. And those extrapolations, they have all several lines here. It has green, purple, orange, cyan. I'm not going to enter too much into detail, but the main point is that, is that uh, by having that uh, extrapolation component, we can test several different scenarios about, for example, what happens if the actors are more aggressive or what happens if they're more conservative and what happens if we have a mixture of them. So being able to project that future under this variety of scenarios is a thing that, and I mean, and make those extrapolations based on a representation that we have validated before is a, thing, is a clear trend that we are seeing for, let's say, several uh, token engineering systems that, systems that are being deployed. And this digital twin is open source, so you guys have the link here if you guys want to execute. But there is a more simple case, which is the Uniswap digital, uh, uh, digital twin. We also have a demo here, so these slides are except. So it's the same thing. We have, for example, the blue one, which is the actual data. We have the orange, which is what, what our cat cat representation thinks it should have been. And for the green at the headlines, we have, let's say, possible extrapolations uh, based on that cat cat representation. Uh, notice that the orange line is very different from the blue line. And that's on purpose, actually, because uh, we have introduced a deliberate bug on the CAD -CAD representation to showcase why backtesting is important, because if not, you are not going to be able to, I mean, every time it comes, it has some correlation, uh, you still need to have that backtesting phase in order to, let's say, to know how much your model represents the reality or not. And just finishing, uh, one also closed related thing, it's not exactly related to the operational digital twin, but it, it is also a evidence that of, of, let's say, of this recent drive towards operation. It's really about the Gitcoin kind of anti-CB operationalized process. So this is a happy role. This could have an entire workshop, but the main idea is that uh, Gitcoin, for example, is a decentralized application. And it has been making using of, of, let's say, of some operational process in order for detect CB or not. And a clear pattern that we have been seeing is that, let's say, uh, we cannot simply have an algorithm that is going to do all the things of us. Most of the time, we need to, let's say, have this loop where, let's say, we collect data. Based on that data that's being collected, we compute what we think that represents uh, or concerns the system in a meaningful way. By doing that, we can use a model that let's say it's going to generate what we think is going to generate those extrapolations. And based on those extrapolations, we can do an evaluation in order to know if we are going to adopt or not. So 
I'm not going to wait too much detail because I mean, it's a rabbit hole on its own. But yeah, conclusions is as token based systems mature, the engineer focus tends to shift from design to agile operations. There is also the thing that uh, those operational problems they tend to put a premium on having clearly defined process and frameworks because it allows them to make it more modular, it allows them to be more, to have a more consistent experience. And also modeling uh, operational setting is easily associated with measuring and predicting the current state of the system. We want to know, let's say, what's happening right now. It's a bit different from the design when you are on the design phase, when you, let's say, you want to actually know what are the feasible uh, trajectories other than knowing where we are right now. And also the complete those different steps uh, allows for a lot of modularity that allows those uh, models to get to be really large scale. And that sort of it, I sort of blow my time. So I would like to go to questions and answers. So yeah, uh, thanks for the attention. Awesome, thank you, Daniela. That was great. All right. Like your hat. Mm -hmm, thanks. So, do you guys have any questions? I have time for one. Okay, yeah. we'll do one question if anybody has one. Can we record the session in case you want to watch it again? Maybe also slower. Mm. <laughs> you can do that. Yeah. So, okay. yeah, guys, uh, I sort of blow my time. So, yeah, thanks everyone. Um, you guys can send my Discord hand on the chat and yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks Great, much. yeah, thank you, Nilo. Oh, I got really loud. Okay. All right. I'd just like to add uh, one or two notes. Wait, do it over here. I think the key point in Danilo's talk, trying to summarize this for the Berlin people because the sound was not super strong here, um, is that um, you know, three years when we started, um, every single project was in the design phase, and we just started and think about okay, how can we, um, how can we create um, automated market makers? How can we create other components that that enable us to run these token-based systems? Now, three years further down the road, we see systems in existence, and we have this data available. And this is new because in traditional economic systems, this data weren't there. And we can use really fine granular data and create feedback loops so that we use historical data, that we also have this back testing and then try to make predictions and other optimization strategies. So we also have uh, initiatives working on reinforcement learning to train agents to, to um, stress test a system. So there are really powerful methods we can bring to those systems to optimize them, to make them more robust. And this is what um, I'd like to highlight with just a very high level, uh, because this is really something very powerful with these new crypto economic systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have one question. Yeah, uh, what data are you guys speaking about? Mike. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Uh, me again. I have a question. Uh, what data do you mean exactly? Yeah. Um, transactional data that we record um, on the blockchain. And it sounds simple because, oh, wow, we have this distributed ledger. We can access everything. So um, this is a, 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 a challenging task in itself because having data on the blockchain doesn't uh, mean you can just plug in your model. Uh, but yeah, we have this data. And in addition to that, of course, we have also the, the, the Web2 layer uh, where we can run analytics from. So um, be it um, other kinds of behaviors prior or past an on-chain transaction. Um, then, of course, we have surveys. We can run other experiments. Uh, like um, not only the main net data, we can put up experiments uh, with real users and track that next to, to a live system to test um, future iterations and future versions. So there, there is actually really rich data we can draw from and learn from, but this needs to be made accessible for modeling strategies like Danilo was trying to map out. 
anything from the chat? No. No. Okay. Cool. Um, then we will move on to who's the winner? Uh, Dow Reward Systems. Um, so <laughs> Livy and Sean. I don't think Sean's here actually, but Livy is in the call. I know I let you in. Hello. Hi, Livy. Well, let me. Uh, it's um, so yeah, nice you that like you guys share? are all there. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Can you see everyone in the uh, from the screen? Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, cool. Um, would you Would you like to share your own screen or? Our... Yeah. Yes. Okay. I will stop. All yours. Go for it. Thank you. There is a protest happening uh, right down the street that it feels like it's here in my living room. I hope the sound is not uh, leaking so much. What is this protest, protest all about so that we can take part? Uh, it's a <laughs> well, long story short, uh, our political system is quite a failure now. So I'm in Brazil for, for everyone to contextualize. So every Wednesday is protest day here. So this is happening now, but um, I'll do my best to keep my focus. And I did uh, just five slides to briefly get into the topic and not extrapolate the times too much. So here we go. So this is, wait, I'm trying to go in presentation mode. So this is the governance. Um, this is the graphic for the panel we had on reward systems a few weeks ago. And uh, the governance is a group um, that we are focused on establishing a new branch of token engineering, focused on governance and decentralization. So why, First, why is it important to uh, have a branch in token engineering focused on governance and decentralization is because um, we see now that most of the top currencies in the charts are governance currencies. And this is uh, somehow a recent phenomena that started happening and we still don't have so much uh, modeling and uh, tools and knowledge available to know what is the impact of these tokens for uh, actual governance. We are learning so much into the DAO space, into the decentralized governance space. There are so many questions popping up still. So uh, what do we need in terms of uh, designing a token that can help us have effective governance and do we need to have governance and financial power separated from the token, for example? Um, what are uh, all types of solutions that we can offer for different types of uses of a governance token? So the governance are this group. We're trying to research on best practices for uh, token engineering in relation to governance and decentralization. And a lot of people, um, I think, I, I think we hear the, the the memo of wanting to decentralize a lot. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Sorry, should I keep going? Uh, yes, we lost you for a second. It was it was on our end. Technical difficulties. So maybe repeat the. But okay. yeah, maybe okay. go back. Uh, 20 seconds. <laughs> okay, yeah, just um, on how we hear so much the memo of um, let's decentralize and the importance of decentralizing, but but wanting to decentralize, uh, how, how what are the first steps for that? Like we want to decentralize and, and now what? So I think there are so many questions that we have been tackling mostly in the cultural aspect of things because economy is a social science. I don't get tired of uh, repeating that. And there are so many aspects of, um, of culture that affect economy and uh, the tokenized process. 
for decentralizing and the governance aspects of it. So uh, one of the topics that we are focusing now on the governance is in partnership with the Token Engineering Academy is reward systems. And why are reward systems so important? So they are directly related to governance, decentralization, the cultural and economic aspects of an organization. Um, first, because it's a way, well, we live in a system of punishment and reward. Uh, all our systems, the system we, we live in the state, the systems we are in our families, in schools, um, in our work, the, the general system of capitalism in which we are mostly inserted in is a punishment and reward system. So people are incentivized to do certain things because they will be rewarded for it and they are punished uh, to take certain action and, and they are de-incentivized to take certain actions because they would be punished for it. So if this is a system that is so present in all our life and we are trying to redesign systems, how can we take a deeper look into how they affect uh, every layer of, uh, of the systems that we are building and how could we produce healthier systems and how could we acknowledge all the value being produced? So something that has been quite lacking in our capitalist system is uh, the acknowledgement of multiple values. And that's something that the crypto space is working so much towards, especially the DAO space, uh, to reward the value for all the contributors and all the contributions that are coming up, especially uh, subjective value, not, not specially, but also subjective values that are usually forgotten in most of our, um, in most of our other organizations. So reward systems are important for um, this acknowledgement of value, acknowledgement of people, um, identification of value flows inside of organizations. So if we see, if we are able to track contributions, uh, we are able to see all the value being produced and we can bootstrap the economy also based on that. So some examples of, um, of reward systems are bounty programs, uh, conviction voting, and other types of um, on-chain funding mechanisms, uh, all types of grants like Gitcoin, for example, um, SourceCred, uh, Coordinate, Craze, MetaCred, that are systems that people that participate in communities can reward other people that also participate in those communities. So it's more a peer-to-peer -peer reward system. And we are trying to look into all of them because they represent the totality of the DAO. So, so yeah, we have this research group that is, start, is starting soon uh, in November, middle of November. And YGG, Sean, and I, <laughs> sorry, it's pretty crazy <laughs> in the background. Um, yeah, YGG and I will be leading this research with the support of the ground control team and the, and the governance and the Token Engineering Academy, of course. And Angela has been putting so much work into this and uh, helping us a lot to get moving. So this process will have uh, partner projects, lectures, and community researches, researchers involved. The partner projects, uh, we are still working on it, but we have one confirmed that is Ocean DAO. So we just passed the proposal in Ocean uh, this week. So that is going to be very exciting. We're going to be looking into the data they have of the grants they've been giving. And the lectures will be around uh, behavioral psychology and uh, reward systems in general, governance, and we'll have uh, community researchers that will come from the community, people that can sign up to participate and pick some of the research questions that will be uh, coming from, uh, from the partner projects. So some of the things that we're looking at is 
what is the motivation of a reward system? So why, why are people motivated to collaborate? Uh, why are they motivated to provide value? Uh, sufficiency, what is the measure of sufficient? How, when do you know what is enough and what is good and uh, what will continue to mo motivate people to contribute? What is the clarity of that system for the, the people that are participating? So does everybody know uh, how their collaboration uh, is rewarded and how does that affect the system that they participate in? And what is the balance between provision and appropriation of resources? So we need the systems to be sustainable and how can we have uh, that sweet spot for having the balance and not uh, burning more resources than we have the provision of them being supported. And um, defining metrics that we can look into uh, the data that we collect through the reward systems and understand in a feedback loop how they feedback uh, the system of information to know that the parameters of the systems are being uh, set in a way that is healthy for the community and how that can be constantly improved. So I'll stop here. I can also take some questions. I'm really sorry about the distraction in the background. Thanks for sharing, Livy. Thank you, Livy. All right, any questions? Yes, we have one. <clears throat> Hi, nice to meet you one more time. Uh, so my question is related to governance. So there are a lot of you know governance frameworks on the market. For example, uh, governance in Compound, governance now, uh, governance in some other non different projects, which at least DAOs they manage billions of TVM inside. So it's something really big and influential. So could you provide maybe some insight? What which governance framework is better or most efficient or something like that. So did you analyze them, the existing governance frameworks? Did you hear that right? It was a little bit hard to understand everything because it was a bit um, left the sound, but uh, it, did you ask how could we analyze yeah, we'll, them? We'll repeat the question. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just asked about the existing governance frameworks, like compound governance, like Aave, like some other, you know, big DeFi projects like Balance, like Synthetics. So what do you think about these governance frameworks? What is most efficient one or best one or they are all equal? So what do you think? Yeah, I think this is a question about metrics because to understand um, what is the best one or how successful they are, need to understand what is success and how to measure that success. So I think that um, there's a cultural aspect that comes with that too, that is understanding the mission of a project and what are the, what are the steps they are taking to fulfill that mission. And if we have the metrics and a system to analyze the data that is being produced, uh, then we could offer that information but, and, and that's something similar to what Danilo was mentioning too, but if we, if we don't have uh, those metrics pre-established or if we don't have a way to analyze the data that is being provided, then it's really fuzzy to uh, answer if it's being successful and then successful for who? I think that's a, another big question of like, who do we want to, um, who do we want to have benefited by the systems? And also if the stakeholders are predetermined within the metrics and some people who are this predetermined stakeholders are having a successful um, path with that protocol, then, then I think the answer would be positive. Thank you. I'd like to add something here because uh, there are more and more mechanisms for voting. There are more, more so for voting, we have one token, one vote, we have quadratic voting, we have vote delegation, and many more concepts. Then we have uh, okay, who is enabled to vote? Weighted voting, uh, voting votes, and 
Now, since we are in crypto and it's so nice to develop all these new mechanisms, you, people tend and communities tend to, okay, tell me what mechanism is the best one. But actually, I, I, I always recommend, I was in a call today, I always recommend, hey, first take a look at participation. And for me, the most efficient um, governance process mechanism is always about participation at this stage. Because sometimes if you look at, okay, this is the token distribution, these are the uh, wallets holding governance tokens, and then compare it to actual voting participation. Today, we have very tiny shares of participation, meaning our system is vulnerable, our system is biased, our system is just not sufficient. So this is today, the most efficient uh, thing to optimize is participation. Awesome. Thanks for the uh, yeah, the comment, Angela. Any other questions? Nothing came up in the chat, so I think we are all covered. Thank you, Libby. Thank you, everyone. I've added a note in the chat, so you can sign up to take part in this program at tokenengineering.org. TE Academy. Um, We'll certainly share the link in a yes. follow-up email. Um, yeah. yeah, for for everyone in uh, the Zoom call, Angela was just mentioning how we have a sign-up link for the reward system research project that Livy was just talking about, and we will send it around afterwards. All right, so then next up we have, and finally, um, last presenter, we have Trang and Richard who will be talking about the work on the token spice with Ocean Protocol um, in the weekly hacks. Richard or Trang, are you in here? I went to bed. Hey, yeah. <laughs> Richard, all right, we have Richard. Trang Hello. is sleeping. <laughs> almost. Oh, almost, he's still here, all right. Maybe, in, maybe next time I could uh, I volunteer to pretend, uh, present first because it's, yeah. 1.30 a.m. <laughs> yeah, that's totally on me. Sorry about that. Uh, Problem. Trying. I don't know. Do you want to go then? You go first. Um, okay. Um, so I share my screen. Um, sorry, I did not prepare like a um, um, slide or um, sort of, but um, yeah, I have something to show. All good. You stayed up for us. That's all that matters. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, token spy. Uh, basically, in token spy, it's um, yeah, it's actually um, just a bit background on That's on my side. Uh, <laughs> right? Yes, we can hear you. Just uh, admiring how simple this flowchart is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, no, it's, um, yeah, it's simple. Um, I, I actually, um, um, was in, was in, um, a cohort of token engineering, um, academy, and then, um, I study and then it's, it's a balancer simulation group. Um, but then I, I, uh, stumble into, um, token spy and then I start working, um, with, other people in in token spy especially richard and and also um angela uh, sean and uh trend from uh ocean um and then yeah we have a uh a weekly hacking on every monday um that people share what they're doing with token spy and and asking questions um getting answer from trend um yeah and um, basically, what I'm working right now is um, kind of this is how the ocean market. Um, by the way, ocean is a um, decentralized data market uh, where people can go and curating data um, and then selling data and buying data um, by um, Web3 wallet. So this is basically how how the ocean market work. Somebody will go and publish a pool 
and then um, other people who um, buying data, um, consume it, or other people can uh, speculate on it or stake on um, on the data that they think that is good, um, that that is valuable. So this is um, the V3 currently um, are being deployed. Um, and um, yeah, what I'm working right now is basically mimicking this um, diagram and then um, turn it into a Python code um, using TokenSpy. And TokenSpy is uh, developing by Trend of Ocean. Um, and um, next, it's um, and 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 the V3 is almost done. Um, as as um, in, in our weekly um, hacking session, we we share a lot. Um, and next thing is um, they they're gonna um, they're gonna publish. I'm um, not publish, but um, the V4 is gonna be live soon. Um, of of ocean the V4 of ocean market. And what I'm trying to do with Token Spy is also mimicking um, what is Ocean before. It's it's uh, it's basically uh, solving a couple of problem um, that uh, they put it quite neatly in in um, one of the um, Twitter posts that um, rock pool and um, impermanent loss um, in v v three is a problem. So. Um, in V4, it's, it's going to be solved uh, that there's no rock pool anymore. There's reducing of uh, impermanent loss. And, and yeah, what I'm trying to do is basically um, using token spy and uh, um, most probably is ocean V4 dot uh, PY um, and then try to mimic that uh, mechanism and then turn it into some things that we can see. Uh, for example, um, here this is V3, and then there will be a couple of um, unwanted uh, scenario where um, somebody creating a data a uh, a data token, and then he immediately become a data well because he hold every data token, um, and then um, and then he can kind of doing malicious um, action like unstaking and selling all his data and then um, yeah, rock pool and then go away with a lot of ocean and then leave everybody else uh, um, like nothing. Um, so um, yeah, this is a unwanted uh, um, scenario. And then is this will not be there anymore in, in Ocean V4, so um, yeah, um, that's what I'm working on. Um, um, yeah, uh, probably that is for me. Uh, maybe Richard have uh, anything else to add? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, sure. Um, I would. Mm -hmm. oh, I think I'm getting an echo. Um, I would also just add that. Uh, so token spices for anyone that doesn't know, token spices is a similar simulation tool to CadCab. Um, and so they're building simulations with token spice in this weekly hack. And then Trent, who's the founder of Ocean, um, he's the guy that actually first mentioned the words token engineering in an article. So to circle back all the way to the beginning. So he's like day one, day one guy. Um, cool. Yeah. And then Richard, we, yeah, yeah we can. I'll just add a few words on top, I suppose. Um, so I'm Richard. I joined the same token engineering course uh, as Trang. And my background is in mechanical engineering, but I work in machine learning and AI now. Um, and yeah, I guess like the main thing I want to add is that token spice, we're using Ocean as our first use case for token spice and trying to simulate the ecosystem, but it can be applied to lots of different projects. And what I'm really excited from on, on the personal side is to use this tool to simulate my own project, which I'm trying to build, which is like, how can we, how can we create AI systems as a public good? And, you know, who are the agents in, the, uh, in that ecosystem and how can we simulate that? Um, and, and another project that's in the uh, Ocean ecosystem funded by OceanDAO is called Absentia. And they're trying to create this open science DSI 
ecosystem. And uh, I'm currently working with them a bit to figure out how we can simulate uh, the science ecosystem and how we can uh, provide rewards to researchers and grants, giving grants and all these sorts of things. And then another project that's in the Ocean DAO ecosystem is Data Union. So we're trying to simulate how can we uh, create these data unions and create good incentive structures within these data unions. And so it's still such early days with Token Spice, and we're just starting to dig our hands into all of these uh, different ecosystems that we want to model. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just really excited to do that. And uh, the the Token Spice hack is growing every single week. More and more people are joining. So it's just really exciting to be uh, part of a project uh, since when, you know, three people were joining the weekly hack and now we're at, you know, maybe something like 10. And um, and yeah, so come join us. It's great. It's, it's a lot of fun. And you get to learn from Trent, who is an absolute genius. So that's it for me. Awesome. Thank you, Richard. Thank you both. And yeah, thank you both. Are there any questions about Token Spice or Ocean from the group? Strong interest in person. Uh, where can we learn more? About Token Spice? Yeah. Uh, the question is, where can we learn more about Token Spice? Uh, join the weekly hack on Mondays. I'm too shy for that. There's, isn't there a recent Medium post about Token Spice? Because it got a new um, logo. Maybe my screen. Yeah. Um, yeah it's, um, so the first thing would be the, the GitHub repo. Uh, it, it's the very first thing that... Uh, yeah, trend update it quite regularly. Um, so we have how to set it up, how to run it, uh, what is this for. Um, if you go to there's resources, also a very as well. yeah. Uh, resource, yeah, a lot of resources. Um, TE for Ocean V3, TE for Ocean V4. Um, and yeah, and the spite uh, work has come from electrical engineering. It's uh, it's something with electrical um, circuit. Um, and then he borrows that work and then brought up a token and then has token spice. Um, yeah. So yeah. here's a link. Um, I will yeah, if you could add that chat. to the chat and then we'll send it around in the email afterwards too. Yeah. yeah. The videos are a great um, place to start. And yeah, you're right. Trent has been promoting this a lot recently. So if you check out some of his recent tweets, I think there's a Token Spice Twitter profile that you can follow and get um, updates on it. And uh, even the logo was yeah. just created like a few days ago. This, uh, this, I think it's like a shark NATO or a fish NATO, a tornado of fish basically is what it's based around. So check out the Twitter for that. Twitter, yeah. Cool. All right. Um, well, I think that. I've got a question. Oh, we got one more question. So, uh, how do you uh, interact with the Ocean DAO? Are you just like a third party open source contributor, or are you working together with the team as part of the team? Um, third party, yeah. So, with as soon as we got out of the Token Engineering uh, Ac Academy course, we wrote a proposal for the Ocean DAO. It was called Ocean Spice. Um, and yeah, we got some funding to continue um, development on uh, on the open source project. And so we're hoping to put another one in for November, for example, um, and that will bring in more funding. And then, so all of the contributors we have, um, we kind of come together at the end of every month and figure out what different people contributed and how much different people should get paid. Um, so uh, like, that's been great for me um, in terms of like quitting my full-time job and stuff. It's nice to know that there's some uh, money coming in. So I just had it in my notice actually like two days ago. So and part of the reason that I was confident enough to do that was because I've been contributing to the uh, Token Spice project. Awesome. Congrats. Maybe you could also Thank you. some light on like the team structure, uh, cool, like team members, I mean, others, mostly developers and engineers or... Like what are the goals inside? Uh, it's kind of open, so I guess like we're we're all we're kind of in the early, very early stages of building a DAO for Token Spice. Almost that's how I kind of feel about it. 
So uh, it's very kind of uh, egalitarian at the moment and everyone just says what they think they contributed. And I think it's worked out uh, really well so far. Um, the people in it, uh, so like developers, I suppose. And then um, Angela as well is a, a, a key member. Um, and Thank yeah, then, uh, yeah, Sean, Sean is in it as well. Um, so I guess like, uh, and then also we have some project management from Longtail Financial as well. Some of the guys from Longtail Financial are, are chipping in um, to help us, you know, do some accounting and finances and some project management. And then also uh, we have a front end engineer working for us at the moment. So the idea is to create a web app um, that the, the original idea was to create a web app that uses token spice as a backend. Um, and that would be like an easier way for people to interact with token spice. Um, but actually what we're doing now is we're creating an app for the ocean marketplace for launching data tokens. And we're using uh, balancer simulation uh, tools behind that. So that it just means that if someone wants to, wants to launch a data set on the ocean market, they, um, there's all these different parameters they have to pick and it's really difficult to understand. And so we're trying to create this front end to make that easier for people. Yeah, similar to the common simulator that uh, Tamara was showing us where you can kind of plug and play and then see how the, the simulation changes. Um, that's kind of uh, potentially a future token engineer application because obviously not everyone is technical enough to build models and, and run all the simulations themselves. So if you want your community to be able to participate, you have to kind of provide them with the tools to be able to do that. So yeah, awesome. Sure. Who knows, maybe in future we can like hatch data tokens and combine them somehow. <laughs> Who knows? Okay. All right. Awesome. Um, well, I think that actually wraps up uh, the presentation. I have one more slide to show the summary of where we, where we just heard from in the world. Um, so this, these are all of the locations where we just uh, although, yeah, Sean didn't end up making it, but um, yeah, across the world, many different time zones. Um, great to see the TE community has such a wide footprint. So um, these are some of the links, but they mostly just it became a mess of chat and we'll send a follow up with a bunch of information for everyone. Um, we've been doing questions and yeah, here's the final POAP information. Um, so that wraps things up for the intro to token engineering session and correspondence from the token engineering community. So thanks everyone for coming and we'll see you maybe next month or in the future at our programs, and et cetera. And maybe Angela has one last word. Thank you, Peter, for running this session and organizing it. And thanks for everyone for joining, uh, staying up late or getting up early. Um, thanks for you being here in Berlin and hope to see you soon in one of our programs. Thank you everyone. Yeah, it's good to be here. Hi everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Angela. Um, Peter, please can you step Put up the um, the page again. The Peter. Yes. I'm Please, here. can you put out the page, the um, the slide down? We just um, put it up now. I'll put the back up. Yeah. So what 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 do you? Okay, you said we, we need to send mail to that, right? Yeah, just send uh, send a message either to this email, um, Peter okay. at tokenengineering.net, or that's my Discord username. And you can include the message in the message hashtag TE back to Berlin. Even though uh, you're not in Berlin, it's okay. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks. You all got your sticker. <clears throat> all right. <laughs> cool. Cool. That's See. it. Oh, yes. People online will have to leave. You can stay, grab a drink, and have a chat. All right. We're going to be closing the Zoom call for everybody who joined. Thank you. See you later. Yeah. Yeah, yeah.
Moritz, um, what have you learned tonight? Please repeat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 